Serious. Predators who were almost murdered, what's your story? I was coming home from a bachelor's party at 2 a.m., and on the way home, I realized we all had forgotten the steak dinner portion of the evening that we had all planned. I didn't want to wake up my wife and baby, drunkenly rummaging around the kitchen, so I had the taxi drop me off at the Dunkin' Donuts a half mile from my house. This was pre-Uber times. I got myself a couple egg and cheese bagels and started walking home. Now. I made sure to take the quieter neighborhood street. Rather than the busier street, in order to make sure to avoid potential drunk drivers. However. About a block into the neighborhood, I see a pair of dudes coming my way down the sidewalk. I consider crossing the street, but realize how insulting that would be to the two men clearly just walking home from a fun evening just like me. When they are a few feet away, I give them a. How you doing? Nod, and they return it with their own. I was so proud of my decision to treat them like fellow bros and not be so suspicious. Then, as they walk past me, one of them pulls his hand up in the air, holding a tire iron, and strikes me in the back of the head hard. I fall into the street from the impact but remain conscious. One holds my arms down while the other climbs on my legs and starts rifling through my pockets. I tell them to take what they want and they tell me to shut up or they will kill me. Then they ask me where my wallet is and when I tell them which pocket it is in, they tell me to shut up or they will kill me. They took my wallet phone and watch and then kicked a few more times in the head but then took off. I was bleeding and super conquest and without a phone at 2.30 am and there was no way I could make it home on my own. I saw a house nearby where the flickering light of a TV could be seen in an upstairs bedroom. I crawled over to the house and pulled myself up onto the porch and leaned against the door and knocked and hollered for help. The homeowner was rightfully scared and didn't want to open the door at that hour for a stranger who wouldn't even stand up to be seen through his front door's viewfinder. I was feeling very faint at this point and was covered in blood from the head wound, but convinced him to call 911 and get an ambulance. I also asked if he could call my wife. At that point he seemed to feel more confident that I was not trying to trick him and he offered me a cordless phone through a chain door. He said he wanted to help but I needed to stay out on the porch because he had just redone his floors and I was bleeding way too much. When the EMTs arrived, they decide they should take me to the better hospital instead of the one a few blocks away, but the route to the other hospital required several blocks of driving on cobblestones. An experience I would not recommend to any conquest individual strapped to a gurney in the back of an ambulance. I needed 24 staples in my head, and the doctors all told me I was lucky to have survived such a massive blow to the head with a blunt object. When I was young. Maybe 4 or 5 years old, my family lived in a small town of about 1200 people. It was mostly a farming town. My dad was the manager of the only bank in town. A farmer missed some payments on a loan, so the bank foreclosed and took his farm. This farmer apparently blamed my father personally, so he went to the bank with a rifle and threatened my father. My father talked to him, cops were called, and the farmer was arrested and arraigned. Bail was posted for the farmer, so he was released from jail. A few days later, my family was eating dinner, and we heard a truck pull up and park in front of our house. It was a really quiet street in a small town, so my father went to the front window to see who pulled up. It was the farmer, and this time he had a shotgun. He walked right up to the front door and knocked, and my family busted ass out of the back door and ran to a neighbor's house. Our front door was unlocked so he could have opened it and blasted us all, but I guess he didn't think to check it. Cops were again called, and the farmer was arrested. My family spent the next week or so in a hotel a few towns away, until it was assured that the farmer would be in jail without the possibility of bail. My ex-boyfriend wanted a gun. I grew up shooting and know enough about guns and gun safety to know he wasn't mature enough for a gun. I told him not to get one. But on his 21st birthday, he went out and bought one. He was so proud of that thing and would constantly take it apart and clean it. One night, he's sitting on the couch, across the room from the TV, cleaning his gun at the long end of the coffee table. I'm perpendicular to him, sitting on the floor, crafting at a short end of same coffee table. Suddenly, the gun goes off. I freak the fuck out. My ex is sitting there, looking stunned. He shot the goddamn cable box. For some stupid fucking reason, he thought it was a good idea to point the gun and dry fired. He was convinced it was unloaded. He initially aimed it at my head. I was engrossed in my crafting and didn't notice, thought better of that and aimed it at the TV. Thought better of that and aimed it at the cable box and fucking shot it. It went through the cable box, then through the walls parallel to a long halfway and ended up in a closet wall. Fortunately, none of the rooms were occupied and it didn't go into an adjacent apartment. 
I was expecting police to show up, but none ever did. That fucker almost shot me, and I was too dumb to note the fuck out of the relationship for a couple more years. I was a freshman in college and, in my first semester, pledged a fraternity. One night, I was assigned to work the door at a party, which was not uncommon. Around 1.30 to 2 a.m., a group of guys that worked at the dining hall. I remembered the one because he made an amazing cheesesteak showed up and each paid $5 per cup. A few minutes after they paid, the last keg kicked and none of them got any beer. As soon as they told me that the kegs just kicked, I started counting out cash to pay them back for the cups that they bought. Before I could get them their money back, one of my drunk pledge brothers decided to physically force them out the door while yelling shit talking them. As soon as I could calm my buddy down I went outside to give them their cash back, only to be met with a big big surprise. When I made it down the back steps, cheesesteak guy aggressively steps forward and says. You'll made a big fucking mistake. I'm strapped as a motherfucker, pulls a handgun out of his waistband and points it directly between my eyes. In that moment, it was remarkable that 18-year-old me didn't shit his pants immediately. A few of the older guys in the house stepped outside and were able to talk the guy down without incident, but it felt like I had that gun pointed between my eyes for an eternity. Long story short, I was incredibly lucky that I didn't get shot that night. Needless to say, I went without cheesesteaks for a few semesters after that night. When I was 10 or 11 my sister who was like 14 or so at the time started dating, which meant my mom forbid it, but would allow them to hang together at our house under supervision. However he just got increasingly weird. He'd show up with knives always, and he would have huge cuts on his body I mean from neck to belly button one time, and said he got into a knife fight. Now if he did it himself, or it was a knife fight I don't know, but then my mom banned my sister from seeing him. What we didn't know was he would keep sneaking into her window at night after that. Nothing ever happened, but years down the road my sister got married and moved two states away, and one night I'm watching TV and his face pops up, he had murdered three people, wrote messages with their blood on the walls of their homes and all kinds of sick things, and when I saw that it reminded me of when he would hang around our house. Like I said he always had knives so a lot of times he would wait until it was just me and him, and then he'd either push me against a wall, or tree or hold me down on a couch, or sometimes even hang me upside down by my ankles, and hold a knife to my throat and say. Just imagine I slit your throat right now, just imagine that this is your last breath so again not as bad as others, but he was a murderer he could have killed me, and my whole family, if he wanted to. He is now on the death row and serving life along with death. For anyone interested you can read about him at this link. It talks about the murders, and you can all see the face that I saw when I was little. Maybe a little bit of a stretch, but my closest brush working at a university, guy called the office saying he used to attend, wanted to re-enroll, but had such a strange set of circumstances that he was elevated to me. After a few mins, I could tell something was off. Turns out he was mentally unsound and calling from a mental care hospital. He sounded like he just wanted to chat and seemed lonely, so his s were always sent to me. He ended up calling once a week or so and mostly just prattled on about nothing, but sometimes would drop something extra wild he told me he was secretly Jesus Christ, he'd actually helped found the university that he owned the city's baseball team. But he knew a secret word at a store in the mall that would get me free soap for life. Anyway, I talked to him each time he called and thought I was helping a lonely old man. After about six months of it, I got a call from campus safety telling me my dad was on campus to visit but couldn't find my office. My dad lives states away, so I obviously knew something was up. I could hear talking in the background and recognized his voice I let the officer know that this was not my dad and that he definitely should not be allowed on campus. They were obviously suspicious, hence the call to me. The officer on duty ended up getting him to give more info turns. Out he'd been released from a mental facility that day for threatening a nurse with a scalpel and then smearing his own shit all over her and his room. I'm guessing he wasn't there to kill me, but. We were all pretty freaked out. He still calls every once in a while, and we just forward him to the campus officer who knows him. Last I heard, he called from jail. I was 11 and meeting my friend on a bridge in town, and when I got there, there were these two 1920s years old guys who were there to mug me. Pretty sure my friend had set me up as some kind of initiation or something. Anyway, things got incredibly weird when I didn't have anything that they wanted and one of them just kind of flipped out and got very aggressive. I was put in a headlock and pulled to the side of the bridge and told that if I cried or made any indication that I was scared that he would throw me off. Some be a man such nonsense. 
I was terrified so of course I teared up, and as he was pushing me into the barrier my friend, who had been silent the whole time, screamed, like a proper scream, and shouted at me to run. The scream had distracted them for a second, so I pulled out of this guy's grip and ran. Me and my friend split directions and they gave chase to me instead of him, but luckily for me there was a police car at the bottom of the stairs next to the bridge with two cops, having their lunch break. I bundled straight into the back of the police car, and when I looked up, the two guys were now running in the other direction. I think the intention was to really scare the crap out of me, rather than anything more serious but to me, 11 at the time, it felt very real. Safe to say I never spoke to that friend again. I was working at a gas station. It was at night and slow, so I was sitting in the office watching TV. All of a sudden, one guy comes in behind me, another guy comes in in front of me. I in front says don't get up. I give him the wad of cash from my breast pocket and then the money from my front pocket. They rush out back into the darkness. I stay put, just like the guy said. Then I call the owner. The car pulls up to get gas. I tell them they need to pay by credit card or exact change because I just got robbed. Then I reach up to touch my neck. It was bloody. The guy in back was holding a knife to my throat. I was a clerk at an appliance repair shop. Some guy had brought his riding lawn mower in to be worked on, but decided it cost too much to have repaired, so my boss asked me to load it up in our lift truck and drive it to his address. I was 17 and had my relatively newly minted license on me, so it felt like a big responsibility, and I was happy to do it. I loaded it up just fine and drove to his address. When I started to unload it I noticed that the battery was unattached. One of the technicians must have removed it to work on it or something. Unfortunately I had no tools to put it back in. I checked the work order and it said. Customer declined repair, needs replacement engine. So I thought. Will you, he won't care, because the engine is dead anyway. I rang the doorbell, and this fat drunk guy with no shirt opens the door suddenly. I had lowered the riding mower off the lift truck and had pushed it into his yard. He yells. What the hell are you leaving that pile of junk in my yard for? I said. Is this not your riding lawn mower? He says. Hell yes it's mine, but it's in pieces and I don't want the damn thing. What the f is wrong with you people? So I apologize and ask him if he wanted me to load it back up. I didn't know what else to say. For some unknown reason this pissed him off even more and he disappeared back in his house. I go back to the truck to radio my boss. This was back in the days before cell phones to see what she wanted me to do. In the meantime that drunk bastard stomps out onto his porch with a shotgun, leveled it at the truck, and pulled the trigger. The windshield shattered and I literally couldn't hear anything but ringing from the noise. I jumped in the truck, started it up, put it in reverse and floored it out of his driveway, almost going into the ditch on the other side of the road. He fires again, this time hitting the passenger side of the truck near the door, blowing shrapnel into the cab of the truck, which hit my leg and cut me a bit. I flew back to work faster than I had ever driven before, called my mom and dad, and told my boss I was never coming back to work there again. The cops came and took my statement, arrested the dumbass, and I had to testify against him a few months later. Despite desperately never wanting to see him again. He only spent about six months in prison for it. Luckily by the time things were settled I had moved away to college and didn't have to worry about him anymore. When I was 19 I dated a girl whose dad was a pisho. Was probably just over 5 feet tall but all muscle. Did a bunch of time in prison for drugs and violent crimes. Once had a guy cut him off in traffic, followed the guy and finally boxed him in, tore open his car door and held a knife to the guy's crotch threatening to cut his dick off until the guy wet himself. This level of crazy. Didn't find most of this out until after the fact. Me and her lived together in an apartment. I worked afternoons, she worked days. There was a couple hours in the afternoon when no one was there. Had a day off one day and was running some errands. Came home in that time frame when no one was normally home and her father came walking out of our bedroom. I asked him what he was doing there and he told me because he liked me he would be honest. He said he was there to rob us. He was on drugs and was in the middle of a crime spree. Held up a bunch of people in the complex who were entering or leaving the building, then came through our bedroom window. He said he looked around and didn't find anything so he was on his way out. He said he wouldn't hurt me, but if I ever told anyone this happened, including his daughter, I would disappear and no one would ever find me and he walked out. The whole time he was talking to me, all O could think of was, don't give him a reason to attack me. That and I had a coffee cup in the living room with almost $1,000 in it. Thankfully he didn't find that. I thankfully never saw him again.
My relationship was on the rocks, and this gave me the needed push to get out of there. I never told anyone what happened until after he died. Just thought of another situation where he could have killed me and also demonstrates how crazy he was. He went away on a hunting trip and while he was gone I came over one day after she got home from school. She was a SR in high school at the time. Her mom was at work and we just sat around on the couch for a couple hours. No exaggeration, three hours after we got home, he comes walking out of the front coat closet. He tells us he wanted to see what we would do if we though he was out of town, so he got home early and waited in the closet for a few hours, peeping on us to see what we would do. Once we felt nothing was going to happen he came out I can't imagine what he would have done if we starting fooling around. Was a firefighter for 15 years or so. As a rookie, I responded to a smell of natural gas call. Fairly common call. Usually just stand around with the lights flashing until the gas company shows up. To this day it is still the most gas volume wise I've experienced in a residential setting. Could smell gas from the cab of the engine from five blocks out. Anyway, long story short two of us, firefighters and two cops ended up making entry into the residence the gas appeared to be coming from. Were able to wedge open the basement entry garage doors. Old school flip up style doors. Four of us marched single file into the dark garage to a door in the back corner that led into the basement. The only gear I had on was my boots and bunker pants. It was hot outside. Anyway, the amount of gas in the garage was almost overwhelming. The door into the basement had a glass window, and the lead officer was using his flashlight to look around inside as he opened up the door. Right as the lead officer was yanking the door open, he spotted someone inside and started yelling. We all rushed in and it was dark and really humid crazy amount of natural gas. Could hear it hissing in. I think I was third in line. Only got maybe three steps in before colliding with the two officers in front of me who had stopped up short. I remember the lead officer just plainly stated in kind of a defeated tone. He has a lighter. Definitely one of those moments where three or four seconds feels like an eternity, but sure enough. In the back corner of this basement slumped back in a ratty old recliner was a middle-aged skinny dude with an orange Bic lighter in his hand. And that asshole flicked that thing at least twice while I was looking at it. I assume he had flicked it once or twice before, which is what caught the officer's attention. Anyway, the four of us just kind of stood there like idiots staring at this dude in his recliner for what felt like forever, waiting for the inevitable explosion. I remember distinctly wondering how big of a crater was going to be left behind. Obviously nothing happened. Once our fighter flight worked its way out the four of us collectively kind of bum rushed the dude. He didn't put up much of a fight, and I was surprised to find him nearly unconscious. We had to carry him out. Dude had busted open the main gas line feeding his house where it entered his basement. Had left a suicide note and everything. He was completely unconscious for the ride to the hospital. Medic stuck an NPA in, and I bagged him the entire way. Not sure what happened to him, or if he even intended to try and take others with him. I actually think the concentration of gas was too high. Above the oil of natural gas, which I think is around 15%. The basement, or at least the area immediately around the recliner, was essentially flooded with too much fuel and not enough O2 to ignite. I was definitely a little lightheaded after spending what was likely less than a minute in the basement. Learned a lot of valuable lessons that day that I try to pay forward. When I was 14, I left home due to physical, emotional and psychological abuse from my parents. I was placed temporarily into a group rescue home that was meant to be short term. I was there six weeks. Normal was two. During that time, I saw a bunch of people come and go, most of them scared kids like myself. Because I'd been there longer than the standard two weeks, they'd moved me into a small private room in the back of the house. I either stayed in there or sat in the backyard and read books. I tried hard to be quiet and non-threatening and had actually started to make friends with some of the other residents. And then there was Ernesto. He was close to aging out of the system and was in the home as a last-ditch effort to keep him out of jail. He'd had issues in every foster home he'd been in and his caseworker was doing her best to keep him sheltered until he could go into the military at 18. For whatever reason, Ernesto was incredibly threatened by me and made his dislike abundantly clear. I was 14, very tall for my age, and borderline malnourished because of my toxic home life. I was absolutely not a threat. A few days before I was due to be placed in a more permanent situation, one of the girls pulled me aside and told me to lock the door when I went to bed. She even suggested I move something in front of the door, just in case. She and one of the other girls had heard Ernesto muttering in Spanish about taking care of me and were worried for me. Turns out, they were right to be. A routine house inspection discovered a large kitchen knife had gone missing. 
a search discovered the knife hidden under Ernesto's mattress. When confronted by the house monitors, he freely admitted he'd planned on cutting my throat that night while I slept. The police were called, he was removed in cuffs, and my own placement was moved up to the next day. For obvious reasons, I didn't sleep well that night. Thanks for watching. If you like the video please drop a like, and to stay up to date with my latest videos, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the button under this video.